So this morning, this morning, we are looking at the final sermon of our Bodybuilders series, which is entitled The Movement, or Movement, The Next Step for Bodybuilders. And inside your bulletins, I'm sure you've probably already found them and probably already read them and scribbled arguments or notes or whatever. The reason I put those in there is because one of the students, <coughs> Kaylee, said how she takes notes during the sermon. I thought, wow, she takes notes. Maybe, maybe other kids or maybe some of the adults take notes. And so there's no fill in the blanks, but it's just kind of a summary of some of the, the main portions that we're going to look at. Because uh, this morning's sermon is, is one of those sermons that... <laughs> It's a good thinking sermon. And what I encourage you to do today is, is you've got the kind of the summaries, points. Look at those scriptures and study them. And talk to God about them. And talk to your spouse about them. And talk to yourself about them. And, and, and if we all do that together, then we will be better for it. Because getting into the scripture always edifies and builds us up. But this morning, we are talking about... The gift of church membership, both within the universal church as well as the local church. And the difference between those two terms, you might say, the universal church is everything, or rather everyone, every Christian in the entire world who, who has been here and who is here now. It is the church, the body of Christ. You might even say it is your extended family. It's very large. But then the local church, local church membership rather, is, is more like your nuclear family. It's smaller. It's tighter. You know one another a lot better. And so the difference is universal is large, local is small. And I'm going to repeat those terms, universal and local, so many times that I have no doubt that you're going to get sick of hearing them. You might even be counting. I hope you're not tallying. Okay, he said universal 17 times. Um, We'll get sick of it together. But the idea about church membership is that it is something that we can easily take for granted. It's sort of like your Bibles. You have multiple Bibles in your home, yet maybe you only read one every now and then. And you go to another country where they don't have Bibles and they are um, taking advantage of pieces of ripped up scripture that they have memorized so that they can share with other believers. So church membership is one of those things that's easily taken for granted because honestly we don't think about it a whole lot. Both within the universal church... Because you think about it, I've been a Christian for so long. I've come to church for so many Sundays in a row. This is just what I do. And then it's almost as if we get into this, this obligatory r routine to where we're not here to serve, but we're just here to because that's what we do. But then even within the local body of Christ, the local church, you might say, church membership, you don't think about that much. I haven't. Shane and I have been here for almost a year. Do you know how many conversations we've had about placing our membership here? I haven't really had any, if I'm being honest, because we haven't thought about it. Because we've been here, we've been a part of everyone, and you don't think about it. Another reason church membership can easily be taken for granted is because we've had a bad experience. For those who are outside of the body of Christ, if you're here this morning, maybe you've had a, a tough go at Jesus and, and you've had a, a bad impression of him through his body and so you just think to yourself, I don't want anything to do with church membership if that's what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Or even within the local church, local church membership, you think that, man, I've seen it done so poorly in the past and I've seen leaders abuse their authority and, and I don't want anything to do with that. I'm just, I just want to be here and I just want to hear a good sermon every now and then. I want to sing a song that I like here and there and then I just want to go. I don't want any more depth to this congregation than that because of bad experiences. You see, what's scary is sometimes we slip into this routine of, of, I have to serve. I have to go to church. I have to pray. I have to read my Bible. 
And before long, we're not appreciating the gift. The gift of belonging to the body of Christ. It's, it's I, I have to rather than I get to. And whenever we find ourselves there, it's, it's a very dangerous area. And, and it's, it's something that we have to fight against the longer we belong to the body of Christ. Is this, I have to do this and I have to do that. It, it's a legalistic attitude. And if we're not careful, it will control us and consume us. And so I want to bring your attention to something that's ironic. This title. Movement, the next step. What's ironic is bodybuilders, and Stan will confirm this from his days of bodybuilding. <laughs> I had this awesome picture in my mind. I didn't make it. <laughs> bodybuilders don't move very well. They are so bound by muscles that they're not even athletic. You, would, you look at them and you think, man... They're probably awesome at such and such sport. Probably not. Because you're so muscle bound that you don't move well. And so as Christians, we have to fight against this. We have to fight against only exercising spiritual growth and not spiritual movement. And by that I mean we come to church every Sunday, we do Sunday school every now and then, we maybe do the midweek class, and we, we get all of this stuff, and we gain all of this knowledge and this wisdom, and, and our spiritual muscles are growing. But if we are not exercising movement, if we're not living out our faith, if we're just coming to church to receive and not to give, to be served and not to serve... We're only gaining spiritual muscle and not exercising spiritual movement. You see, movement is the next step. It's a necessary step. It's a necessary step because Jesus is not dead. Amen? That got a few of you excited. So, <laughs> movement is the next step because Jesus isn't dead. And when we become part of his body, we become, as scripture says, we are made alive. And so all of a sudden, we should be moving everywhere. We should not only be coming to church, but we should be taking what we get at church and we should be first off serving the church and then loving our neighbors, serving our communities. And so since Jesus is alive, we embrace the gift of God to be part of that being alive, part of the body of Christ. In fact, that's what movement is. Movement is embracing the gift of church membership, both in the universal and in the local. So we'll start this morning by looking at how the universal church membership is a gift. You know, the first five chapters of Romans sets up this idea that everybody has sinned. Both Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the same condemnation, all deserve the same wrath. But Paul also says that all are saved in the same way. And those who are saved become members of bodies of Christ. And there's one requirement that we learn from Scripture, one requirement that is needed in order to be a part of this universal church, and that is faith. Paul writes, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So faith is the only requirement that is needed, but whenever we get to looking at Scripture, we understand that this faith is expressed in three different parts, which culminate into our admittance or acceptance into the body of Christ. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these. I think you're probably familiar with them. The first part of faith expressed is, is our belief and our confession of who Jesus is. As Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we too must believe that and confess that. This will lead us to recognize how sinful we are in light of God's awesome and Jesus' sinless behavior, which leads us to repentance. We repent because our lifestyle is, is wrong and is glorifying ourselves rather than God. This is the point to where we actually begin to turn away from ourselves and turn and go towards God's plan for us, the place that God had des has designated for us to receive His Spirit, which is baptism. Baptism is by immersion. It is... Um, 
it is, as I said, it is the place that God says, go here and I will give you this. And so we do it. It's the point where we are united with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And from that point on, we have a renewed outlook on life. Or maybe even, you might say, a new outlook on life. We're living differently. We're, we're behaving differently. And we're being controlled, not by ourselves, but by Jesus. Paul goes on to say, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. And so it is through this faith that we are connected to the body of Christ, that we join the universal church, the, the greater church. At one time, the word Catholic meant universal. And so early on, whenever they referred to the Catholic church, they were talking about the universal church. This is the body of Christ that we're connected to. Paul tells the Corinthians that the body is a unit though it is made up of many parts and through all its parts are and though all uh, through all of its parts are many they form one body so it is with Christ and again he says now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it now all of this is possible because God's grace that's why it's a gift Paul makes this point clear multiple times in his letter to the Romans. He says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many, oh there it is, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And of course, 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Gifts from God come with no strings attached. He knows how to give good gifts. In fact, Jesus says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give, do, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I had never thought about this. The gift analogy fails for some people. After a class on Wednesday night, somebody came up and, and we were talking and they said, hey, you know, sometimes the gift analogy doesn't work for people. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, think about it. Not everybody has a good father or a good mother or good people in their lives who give gifts with no strings attached. Sometimes you get a, a gift from somebody and they say, you're going to owe me for that. And so down the road, they say, hey, you remember that, that thing I gave you? Yeah, that's time to pay up. And so give, giving good gifts for people, it, it misses out on them sometimes, this analogy, because we live in a fallen world with evil people who do evil things. And I don't know, I hope none of you did, but there are fathers in the world who, unlike the father here, if the son asks for a bread, for bread, he's going to get a stone. Or for fish, he's going to get a snake. There are evil people in the world who give terrible gifts or who give gifts with strings attached. But that's not how our Father is in heaven. God is uncorruptible by sin. He is not evil, nor is He influenced by unrighteousness. He doesn't give you the gift of salvation with one hand behind His back, thinking to Himself, <laughs> you sucker. No. He gives you this gift of grace, this gift of Jesus, and He gives it to you with, with both hands. And He says, this is a life-changing gift. I'm going to give this to you. And this is what's going to be expected of you. 
because it's going to change your life and you're going to want to be changed by it. See, the bottom line is we don't deserve the gift. We don't deserve grace. We're rotten in our hearts. We're, we're, we're idolatrous to the core. If life were fair, we'd get hell. Not a free gift of salvation. And so what's awesome is God demonstrates His own love for us in this, His own love for you in this, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And so whenever you accept the invitation to be a part of Christ's church, whenever you accept uh, the gift of salvation and start living in the kingdom, you start doing kingdom work. And I believe that the Bible sets a precedent for us as believers to unite ourselves to a local body of believers to do that kingdom work together so that we're not alone. And so local church membership is a gift, I believe. And this morning, we're just going to ask two questions. Because these questions really matter. Is local church membership even biblical? For those of you who are here on Wednesday night, I just kind of gave you the challenge. Look in your Bibles and find me some scripture that says it's biblical. Because if it's not, maybe we shouldn't be doing it. And secondly, if it is biblical, how in the world is it a gift? Because if you've been around church long enough, and if you've been a part of church, you understand that sometimes we Christians are less than easy to get along with. So is it biblical? And if it is, how is it a gift? Now I want to make sure we're all on the same page you should understand by now that church membership does not mean that you're part of a club. Tithing or, or offering is not membership dues. You're not here just for yourself. You're here for Jesus. It's not about you. It's about Him. So church membership at the local level means joining together with a group of believers, a group of believers that is in your Jerusalem, to live a life focused on glorifying your king and sharing the gospel and the serving. And I believe that this kind of, of church membership requires three things. First off, you have to be a part of the universal church. You have to belong to the body of Christ in order to join a local body of believers. And secondly, they're not really as important, but you have to be willing and you have to be you know, to where you agree with the fundamental doctrines or the teachings of the church. It's pretty much, I think, all that's required to be a part of a local congregation. Universal church membership, wanting to, in agreement. So the evidence this morning we're going to look at for why I believe local church membership is biblical is we're going to look at some scripture that deal with leadership and some scripture that deal with church discipline. So without church membership, scriptures dealing with leadership lose their force. And in fact, they kind of lose their, their meaning. They almost become pointless if there is no local church membership. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So here's a question for this. If there is no biblical requirement to belong to a local church, then which leaders should we obey as Christians? Should we listen to the leaders of the Westboro Baptist people who say that you have to picket funerals of soldiers in order to be a Christian? Are those the leaders that we as Christians are to listen to if there is no church membership? Furthermore, if there is no biblical requirement to belong to a local church, which Christians will leaders be accountable for? <laughs> and hopefully those of you who are leading have, have seen this verse before. Otherwise, it's kind of a scary verse. Obey, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. 
does that mean, as it seems to imply, that the leaders within a local congregation are responsible for the believers that are in their flock? And that on the day of judgment, they could potentially have to stand before God and explain why you let this person do this, or why didn't you lovingly go to this person and say this? So are the leaders of this church accountable for the behavior of every single Christian in Iberia? If there is no set church membership, are they going to be held accountable for what the crazy folks at Westboro Baptist do in the name of Jesus? Consider Paul's teaching to the elders at Ephesus and the believers at Thessalonica. Acts 20:28 20, says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That term overseers can be translated as bishops or pastors or even elders. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Without membership, how do the elders at Ephesus know who is in their flock? How do they know who they're supposed to watch over and keep uh, guard of? The same question is asked today. Paul to the Thessalonians writes, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Again, how did the Thessalonians know who was over them unless there was some form of commitment to be under them and as well as for them to lead, to them, for them to be over? Just a general question for this leadership thing is how is leadership and submission going to work if there is no expressed desire to be a member or to be under or to be over, to be led or to follow? If there's been no commitment for those who want to lead and for those who want to be led, everything just seems kind of confusing. So leading and following in the church, as far as what Scripture sets out as God glorifying, that means that if you belong to a church, if you're a member of a church and there's an elder or elders or leaders who are abusing their authority, that is not God glorifying, and you don't have to set under that kind of leadership. So leading and following in the church doesn't make sense unless believers choose to become members of a local congregation. I believe that this is also true for church discipline. So Jesus and Paul both talked about church discipline. In Matthew, Jesus says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he, if he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So it appears what Jesus is saying is that the church, the local church, it would appear, is the final court of appeal for problematic situations between believers. That if, if they are unable to work out their issue, then they take it to the, the body. John Piper asks the question, if there is no church membership, how can you define the group that will take up this sensitive and weighty matter of exhorting the unrepentant believer and finally rendering a judgment about their standing in the community of believers? He goes on to say, it's hard to believe that just anyone who showed up claiming to be a Christian could be a part of that gathering. Surely, the church must be a definable group to handle such a weighty matter. And this is sort of like one of those issues that arises within your family, that you take care of within your family. You don't go to Facebook and you say, man, I've got this terrible problem with this terrible person who I'm related to, do, 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 whatever. Some things are handled best whenever it's the family dealing with them. 
And so as Christians, it seems what, what Piper is, is, is getting at is as Christians, there is a nuclear family of believers within the local assembly of the saints who are able to deal with their issues. But if there is no definable group, then anybody can deal with these issues, which could present certain problems. And again, this isn't talking about bad sins, sexual abuse, and different things like that. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. So here's what the context is. There is a Christian, this is a believer, who is living this sinful lifestyle that Paul says the pagans don't even do. And rather than the Corinthians putting him out or dealing with this sinful issue, they're celebrating God's grace. They're going, yeah, this is, this is awesome. This is okay. Look how loving we are. But Paul says you should have dealt with it. And this is how you deal with it. You put them outside of the fellowship. Now in the second letter, Paul writes for them to bring him back in. So this isn't a permanent type of excommunication. You might, if you want to use that word, it kind of has some negative thought to it. But the question is, how can a believer be put outside the church if he, there is no inside the church? If there is no deliberate desire for a believer to be led by the leadership and to accept their judgments and, and accept the judgments of the church in total, if there's no desire to do that, then how can a person be outside the church or be put outside if there is no inside? Or as Matt Chandler asks it much more simply, how can you kick someone out if there isn't an in? If there is no local commitment to a, a community of faith, then how do you remove someone from that community of faith? And so just as with the leadership pas passages, it seems that with also church discipline passages, that without some kind of commitment, willingness of individual believers to unite to a, a local body of membership, Seems like church discipline and leadership just kind of, it just doesn't make sense. So let me share with you how church membership is beneficial and how it is a gift. First off, the level of church membership that I'm talking about, the local church membership is a physical reminder of a spiritual reality. We don't see the universal church. We don't, uh, we're not able to peer all throughout the world and see all of the believers at the same time as God can. We can't do that. But within the local church, we experience the constant encouragement and sometimes loving rebuke that Jesus has for us. And we're reminded that we're part of something greater whenever we're part of something smaller. Not only is church membership a physical reminder of a spiritual reality, but it is also an expression of the universal church. Because whenever the local body of believers moves, it is the universal body of believers moving also. Because even though we are part of the body, even though we're one unit, we're part of the greater body. And so the kingdom of God grows as believers unite together to do kingdom work. Jesus moves through the local body and through that he's moving in the world. And finally, church membership at the local level is a gift because it is a microcosm example of the universal church. It's because of local church membership that we are able to exist in such a tight-knit community to where whenever I am having struggles with sin, I can go to my brother in Christ and say, I need your prayer. You wouldn't do that with just any believer. But if you are together as one group working together for the same goal, it may become much easier to go to someone who you know is just as committed as you are and you can say, I need your help. You see, the way the local body of believers works towards a single goal should reflect the universal body at large, which is we aim to bring glorification to the head 
which is Jesus, or who is Jesus, and, and as the head moves, and as the head wants us to move, so we move together. And so movement towards embracing church membership matters because you were created to belong. And whenever you belong, you realize there is work to be done. Not only were you created to belong to God, but God has given you this perfect opportunity to belong. He says, here's a gift. Boom. Open it up and you're mine. This isn't like Pandora's box where we open it up and all of a sudden a bunch of terrible stuff starts happening in the world. The gift that God gives us, we open it up and all of a sudden we're transformed, we're changed. We're no longer out, but we're in. We're part of the body of Christ at Universal, at large. To belong means that you're living under the authority of Jesus. You're part of the body, that he is the head. And as a result of being part of the body of Christ, you're called to do kingdom work. Jesus, the Great Commission is called, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's kingdom work. Work to be done since we are citizens of a greater kingdom than what we live in now. In Acts 1.8, Jesus, just before he ascends, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's Iberia, and in all Judea and Samaria, that's Missouri, and the United States, and to the ends of the earth. And so one of the ways that God equips us to do kingdom work is through the local body of Christ, through the local church. The local body of believer, believers that we unite ourselves to because they are in our Jerusalem and we want to do work first in our Jerusalem and then in Samaria, in Judea, and to the ends of the earth. And so this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to join me in accepting the gift of church membership. And that's what we're doing. That's what Shane and I have decided to do is to make Iberia Christian Church our nuclear family. Our family that we can lean upon and, and our family that we draw encouragement from and if need be, our family that lovingly rebukes us or guides us. As part of the universal body of Christ, that's my extended family, but I want you all to be my nuclear family. Furthermore, I'm placing myself under the authority and the care of the elders. This means that I expect them to speak truth into my life, even if it's truth that I don't want to hear, because I believe that is what their role is within the local congregation. And because I understand that they will have to give an account for my actions one day. I expect them to bring me back into the fold if I'm going astray because that's what a shepherd does to his sheep. He watches over them and he cares for them. And I do all of this because I believe that's what it means to be part of a local church, to be a member of a local body of Christ. And as I am a member of, of the local or the universal body of Christ as baptized June 17th, 2001 at Mountain View Christian Church, I don't need to be baptized again because we're baptized into Christ's church, not into an individual church. I'm not up here. No one has, has tied me to do this, manipulated me, tricked me, pressured me. In fact, I just mentioned to Stan this past Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, I just said, hey, I think we're going to do this. He said, cool. Not once has he ever said anything to me about it. Not, not anything bad against him. And finally, I agree with the teachings of, of Iberia Christian. I, I, I am in agreement with the fundamental doctrines of, of, of salvation and, and what it means to be a Christian. So I want to be a member. And I invite you to do the same. I invite you to think about these things throughout the week and throughout the months and the year, the rest of the year. But more importantly, which is much greater and bigger than, than local church membership, is belonging to the body of Christ. 
through universal membership. And so as the worship team comes back up here, I just want to challenge you to look at yourself and ask, have I received the gift that God gives so freely? Have I received it? Have I taken it? Have I opened it? Am, am I utilizing this new life? Maybe you've never taken it before and I invite you to not only stand outside but to belong because that's what it means to be part of Jesus. Being part of his body means that you are alive and you belong to God as you were created for it. So if you would, please stand and sing the final song today.